but we want to talk just very briefly a little one-on-one -on -one of recruiting, the difference between executive retained recruiters and contingency recruiters, and kind of how we're motivated. I think if you understand that, it, it, it's a little bit better of how you work with us. And then we'll talk a little bit of, uh, different about small, large, you know, boutique firms, just, but very quickly. You want to talk about yeah, one -on -one? so um, uh, retained executive search is, um, by the way, evolving as we speak to the point where some of us think five years from now it may look very much like, um, say, management consulting in the sense that we are paid up front to run a project. The project happens to be about running a process that, that is finding the available, going through the, the universe of available candidates to get to the best candidates <coughs> who fit the position that the client's looking for. Um, and but we're paid up front. But we are paid up front. Um, and because there's recognition that uh, it is a, it's a process that has to be run and uh, that we have to get paid to do it. Well, Otherwise, yeah. Before you do that, you may want to mention how a typical retain search from actually you get compensated typically, broadly. Yeah, you know, to know to know the difference. I mean, you're typically that's you know, unlike like a strategy project, like a, you know, a Booz Allen or McKinsey, where you get paid for a project. Ty typically, at a search firm, you're, you're compensated for like one third of the total cash compensation, or, or something like that. Yeah, it varies by some, some percentage. But that as as a guide, mm -hmm. there, there's an amount. Yeah. So so it is variable, and it's also there's an incentive generally to get it complete. Like you'll get paid something up front. There's also kind of like a, Sometimes a little bit, yeah. There, there's like kind of almost about like a bonus at the end if you get the search done. Right. So it is a different kind of um, payment model typically than what like consulting would be. So that's what else. Yeah. And there's um, then there's contingency search, which is entirely different from what we normally um, do. And except for what John said, which is that I mean, if we're really candid about it, usually there's a small percentage of our total fees that are contingent upon a successful placement. However, contingency firms are firms that operate under the notion that they only get paid on the placement. Um, and our, those are the, frankly, you know, um, you can imagine what the incentives are there. Then. Uh, it's usually more about getting a volume of candidates, paperwork in front of the client, and hoping that something sticks, doing it in the lowest touch, highest volume possible way. Right, I mean, it's just that's if you kind of sit down and think through the business model, that's what, what works there. Um, in our case, again, I think the, 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 the we're constantly moving further and further in this direction every day. Is that you know we we're getting to the point where it is much more about higher touch, of uh, being very involved with the client and understanding what it's really going to take to get the fit right, who's really going to be successful in this role for the client, in the culture. Um, and you know, and, and all of the other circumstances that they're in the right location and the compensation's right and all that stuff too, and that is that's a lot of moving pieces. But it's really about managing a project that gets you to that end point. The dynamic tension is always between the notion that we're running a high touch process, and a lot of clients who say, well, you know, where's your skin in the game? What's what's to keep me? What's you know, I pay you a hundred thousand dollars up front. And you walk away, you know. I, I still have an open position. Well, I'll tell you, it, it it cuts both ways, though. One third of all searches historically do not get completed with an outside candidate. Of those, I would say I don't have the empirical analysis, but I, I guarantee you that if we did the analysis, 90 plus percent of those are because there was a merger. Uh, the client had an internal candidate and they were just kicking the tires and wanted to validate externally what the market was. Um, the market changed and there wasn't the money left in the budget to fill the position. The hiring um, person got fired or... Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I forgot about that. The hiring person got fired. Or promoted. Or promoted and suddenly there's a new person in the hiring role and they don't necessarily buy into the reason the per or what the spec is or anything like that. And that's like a third to 40% of the time, believe it or not, um, historically, year in and year out. Um, and it has, and most of it has nothing to do with, the, especially when you're dealing with high quality firms that are incented on getting the work done and the, the, the feedback that the clients give, it has nothing to do with whether or not the firm engaged was able to find qualified candidates. 
Um, so we that that's the dynamic tension that often goes on, and that's why God bless contingency people. I don't know how they do it because you know they're just constantly working in the hope that somebody will see something they like and end up hiring a person. But you've got all these other mitigating circumstances going on. Um, so that I mean, but that's the general notion, and we and so hence it's very important for us to know high quality people who who can fill these positions that we get retained to fill. But in the end, our job is to manage those projects that we've been retained to manage. There's a subtlety that I just want to add to. Is, yeah. uh, the contingency firms are representing the candidates. So For they will people. represent those candidates to as many clients as they possibly can. That's a very good point. In retained search, if you're at a good firm that has some ethics, they, they represent the candidate, which you may be, to one client at a time, rather than multiple clients. Because you really don't want to compete against your own clients. So. As a candidate, that's something to keep in mind. Is this the right opportunity? Because I may not be considered for other opportunities at this same search firm while engaged on this one. It doesn't always work that way in practice, but that's that's what we try to do. And there is a difference between large, um, mid-sized, and boutique firms as well. Um, I've been in all three. I, I started out at Russell Reynolds, and then I went to a more of a mid-sized firm that was trying to establish a regional presence here in the D.C. area, and then I recently started my own firm. And there's different drivers um, to the relationship building. Um, you have to understand the basic business model of search, which we kind of talked about, but there's different, in the large search firms, there are some that are public and there's some that are private. Now, this is just, Vicki Fiore, personal view, um, search is a professional services, it is a private client service that should be not public, but some of the firms are, are public, and and even though they say it doesn't really matter, there are some firms, sorry, Corn Ferry, I hope the microphones are on, Corn Ferry and um, Hydric are both public, and so they have numbers, and they have board reports, and they have quarterly earnings reports, and they have shareholder value, and they have people that they're accountable for other than their clients. And as a large search firm or a mid-sized search firm, you're also accountable to the owner or the, or the, or the partners. Um, but I'm accountable only to myself. So I can make my own decisions. So it gives me a little bit more flexibility, but it also gives me um, greater challenges in, in reach and, and et cetera. So there's all different reasons to, to include everybody but if you are looking to hire somebody what you want to do if you're if, when you get an appointment or when you're looking to hire a retained search firm is who's going to give you the right person who understands you who understands your business and it is evolving into consulting it is a trusted advisor my clients look at me to tell them what I think and they want me to tell them what I think um, and that's what I get paid to do, and to find them the right person. Now, we don't always agree, but we have very good conversations about that. And they make the ultimate decision, but they value my opinion. Why is it evolving into consulting? Is it risk aversion on the part of the clients where they're more, more choosy? I mean, why, why, what is driving that? Um, technology is disintermediating a lot of what people used to think search was about. So it's not, it's not about finding the list of people to call. <laughs> 10 years ago, 20 years ago for sure, uh, a large part of what people felt like they were paying for and what people felt like they were doing was finding the right list of people to call. Yeah. What was the, da the, the database uh, yeah, yeah. That, that we had? Yeah. 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 They were hiring the process, the access and the process. Yeah. Now, it's they really are looking for the industry experience, the technical you know, experience, the, the cultural feel, the right fit. So it, there's more aspects to what you're trying to get when you hire an executive, or you should be trying to get when you hire an executive recruiter, as opposed to just somebody who can fill a slot. I mean, there's tons of job boards, there's tons of other things. The other thing that I would add to that is, I think you'll find as you talk to us and you talk to um, our colleagues at other firms, you'll find that we tend to be very specialized. Um, and there's a reason for that. So I do CFO searches, and that's basically it. Um, and companies only generally have one CFO, um, and so it's something that they go through the hiring of a CFO is something they go through relatively infrequently. Um, and so if you're a CEO, uh, you really don't have the insight into what the CFO market looks like. And so not only are you going to want to meet candidates, you also want to know how are CFO roles structured in other companies. 
um, what are the reporting relationships, what are the, the skill sets that are really important that, that other kind of best in class companies are looking for. So mm -hmm. we tend to be very specialized and part of what we can do um, for our clients is not only help them fill the seat, but also help them think about how they, they structure their management teams and their organization in general. And, and then at a, just a basic level, I think there's an increased attentiveness in industries as a whole you know, to focus on leadership and the value that a key leader brings to shareholders. And that's just something that I think you know, everybody in business has been educated on in the last 20 years. And, and let's face it, these are difficult decisions for executives to make. Hiring the right CFO is a decision that you know, a lot of people don't enjoy making because if you make a bad decision, it, it hurts. And I think having a trusted advisor is something that, that uh, executives value when they see you as that. Not everybody's seen as that, but when you've really built a relationship and you really understand your client, you really understand your market, you can help that client make a tough decision that they're struggling with and, and, make a, and feel better about it. There's, the, the industry, it's evolved a lot in 20 years. I mean, you can even see it at the, the big search firms. You've got like, people who've been doing it a long time versus the people at, at our stage where you know, a lot of the people you're going to deal with now, they're either a lot of MBA types who could be just at home at like a consulting firm or in like a you know, Fortune 500 company or they've got like, a lot of time in the industry. Um, so they look and feel more like the candidates themselves. And that's what's, I think, evolved over the years. Whereas before it was more you were hiring somebody who might kind of represent the firm, might have a database behind him or her, but they didn't maybe look like the candidate themselves. So I think that's evolved a lot, just in maybe 10, 20 years. Yeah, definitely.